Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone, that there are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon is growing all over the world. This is episode number 429. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hey, everyone. This is a great time. I mean, we had a big victory, in my opinion, yesterday with the Supreme Court um, unanimously decided that President Trump uh, has to be on all the ballots of the states. Now, oddly enough, and not surprising, the the other side is already raising up and trying to make legislation to override that, I guess, state by state. Um, but they can't, but I, but technically they can't well, because I, I the Supreme Court has already overruled. I listened to Jay Sekulow yesterday because he, you know, he's got such uh, knowledge in, of the Constitution and you know, tries to stand up for the rights of Christians. And he was saying that this is a victory, but you know, it's not over. So just keep praying and, and believing that things are going to turn around. We are in the season of Esther, you know, the the season when uh, everything that Haman planned to exterminate God's people got turned around. And, I mean, that's that's what we're facing here. This, this is a spiritual battle Go on ahead. taking away Christians' rights, you know, putting us in some kind of a, a system to where we become slaves. And although I believe we've been slaves for many years, it's kind of catching up to the knowledge of where we're at right now. It is. And when you, when you look at the way that the, the communist playbook, you know, the first they do the name calling, then they try the legal avenue. And finally, when that doesn't work, then they always resort to the end of a barrel. And so we need to, we just need to be praying that it doesn't escalate to that point. Uh, because I think that they, they have an agenda, mm-hmm. and that agenda is bad. And I think that probably China is, is pulling a lot of the strings. Uh, in fact, I was talking with an individual up in Canada, and he says, you're, you're pronouncing Canada wrong. It's called Chanada, <laughs> <laughs> because China is, is really, has, uh, really in control of, of Canada now, and, and things are just really getting bad up there. Oh, they've been working here through people in the... Uh, political arena for many years, and it's just now coming to light. Um, but that's what's so wonderful about God um, is, you know, Satan will think he's got something all sewed up, and then God just within a second can turn everything around. And the good news about um, the God that we serve is he is all-knowing. Yeah, He knows things we can't even imagine. And so how Lucifer thinks that he's going to, uh, override him is something else. I guess he just thinks if he gets his, more people on his side, they'll win. Um, but that's so comforting to me, and it should be to you too. You know, God's been talking to me here lately about how he can do things, and the enemy can't even see it, they can't even see it coming. You know, even in individuals' lives, I think that God is is moving, and the enemy is fighting, you know, and people are struggling, but he can't even see what God's got planned. No. There, he's limited. And, you know, even in um, the demonic realm, they have to do a communication uh, through demons. They do. You know, where God can just speak to his people. He can, he can have a plan in place, and he, the Holy Spirit can just impress upon you, do this, do this. And that just brings such comfort to me because no matter how bad it looks, no matter what's going on, our God reigns. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things in this— kind of falls into this, I think, with some of the techno uh, technology that they're trying to put together uh, with the hive mind and everything else, Satan is going to try to use technology and the quantum internet and everything else to mimic what God has. That's why I think everything kind of comes to a, a crescendo in the last days, uh, that uh, these people literally lose their souls, literally and figuratively, and, and, and that the kingdom of darkness is having direct input into their minds like never before. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why God is moving, and I think he's going to be doing a lot of things this next year uh, that is, is actually going to be beneficial to the remnant. Mm-hmm. I agree. And, you know, I, I know that there are some shakings going to happen. I, I don't see any way that that God's people can move forward unless there are shakings. Uh, I do think, though, that that 
all your prayers are being heard, guys. I, I had some uh, disasters that I was praying about against uh, for January and February, and praise the name of Jesus, they didn't come to pass. No. You know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll just get an urgency or something, and then, then everybody's praying, and then God stops it. Now, it may be pushed down the road, but thank God, because every, every day that we get to live in the level of freedom that we have here, praise the name of Jesus. It's only by um, God's providence, His sovereignty, that He can just you know take the prayers of His people and, and have mercy in situations. And so I, I'm very encouraged today. I, I just feel like that, um, that God is moving mightily in His people. And uh, one of the things that happened this week, because I've, I've just been seeking God so much on... You know, I know I know that this is a Babylonian system that we're in, and and I've been praying about that for a long time, and felt like you know I'm I'm in the middle of this Babylonian system. I think I was put there as a child, but I just believe as I plead the blood of Jesus into it, it's going to crumble. You know, the blood of Jesus destroys every work of wickedness, and I just every day plead the blood of Jesus into it. And I was having a discussion with Steph this week, and she's she's been reading a a book uh, by. Erwin Lutz are called the Church in Babylon, and one of the things that he brings up, um, and I did I did a little research online. He believes that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were um, made eunuchs when they were in Babylon, and that I know that was a common practice. I've looked up several opinions online and things, and and some people disagree with it. But he was he was under the prince of the eunuchs, and he changed their names. So, I mean, it kind of stands to reason that's probably what happened to them. Well, it was standard practice, practice in the ancient world, because especially if you were bringing in the aristocracy of a, of a conquered nation, mm-hmm. the last thing you want is them to have descendants to raise up and overturn the government that did that to them. And so it, it was standard practice, if you're bring, especially if you're bringing them into a position within government that they were going to have any kind of power. Well, I know that um, when Daniel wasn't decided he wasn't going to eat defiled food that was the one he asked for permission so obviously he was under that person's jurisdiction so i i believe that there's a a very good chance that happened and in the book he was talking about how you know what was so important in the uh, jewish community about their their lineage all those things would have been stripped from them when that happened yet they were so devoted to god that they refused to bow yeah and I, you think about that in contrast to where we are today. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I complain every once in a while to God. <laughs> I try not to. But, uh, you know, with, with seeing of everything, everything I've seen in the occult and, and these powers of darkness, and I get discouraged sometimes because I think if, if everybody could just get a clear view of how these principalities and powers gain such power to do things, gain such power you know if if you talk to anybody that's ever been connected to the occult they're going to tell you that the two hardest months are february and august and and the reason for that is one for february is is this, it's a cult just every minute there's just something that's that's permeating society and so every person that participates in those things knowingly or unknowingly there's power built in the kingdom of darkness and so every once in a while you know i'll have a little a little complaint session or something. <laughs> and then I, I hear something like this. And then I tell you, it just wrecked me. It wrecked me this, this week because I thought, I don't have a reason to complain about anything. We are so blessed in this nation. I'm telling you, it's unbelievable that God has had mercy on us. And uh, I thought, if these men could do that in that situation, how much more should we be able to stand? Exactly. Exactly, Mary. We have, well, even look at Mary, look at the early church being persecuted from every side. And they considered that persecution as an honor because they, they had something worth living for. And I think in, in many ways, you know, Jesus warned us in Revelation about the doctrine of Balaam. And this, this is one of the things I remember. Um, oh, what's the... Um, What's that minister that he ended up uh, being a chaplain for some what ended up being the Illuminati with the oil things we used to listen? Uh, Lindsey Williams. Uh, he talked about how that they knew that God's hand was on America because of the Christian influence in America. 
And the only way that they, because they, they want America to fall. Absolutely, they want America to fall. And the only way that they could do it is to get the church in such a mess that God would judge America and that he would take off his hand. And, I, I, and you know, one of the things that, I, that, I, that I've prophetically spoke over the last, I guess it was two or three years ago, uh, probably it's probably been longer, I'm, I'm thinking back maybe all the way back to 9-11, is that the universal protection of the hand of God that was over the nation is now gone. Individually, that's a whole different ball of wax. And I believe and, for states. Yeah. I, I think if they'll go ahead and, and continue to block the abortions, and, and I think there'll be protection over states. There is, and, and in fact, they're, they're trying to get uh, uh, enough signatures here in Missouri to try to make abortion a constitutional issue. And uh, there was a big scuttlebutt on, uh, on uh, our local news channel that uh, the, the ones that were getting the petitions were actually lying about what it was about. One was, one was about uh, gambling and there, you know, all this was going to go to teachers and there's actually nothing in the bill about any money going to teachers. And the other one was they were kind of covering up the whole thing about, uh, about making abortion. And so the, the enemy doesn't play fair. All they care about is signatures so they can do what, what they're going to try to do. But I really think that the, the, whole, the whole purpose of Roe versus Wade being lifted off the nation was so that God was using this as a litmus test on which states were going to have protection and which states weren't. Well, you know, the, the constant push from the world is they want to us all assimilate to our surroundings. They want us all to, to just mold into the patterns that they accept so readily and we're supposed to be a stark contrast to this darkness. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye renewed by the transforming of your and mind. And so my prayer is, God, let us be such a bright light of the gospel for you that, that it tear the darkness up. Father, let the, the light that's in each one of us that has is, is devoted our lives to you, let it, let it dispel the darkness everywhere yes, we go. Absolutely. In you Jesus' know, name. You know, there's a couple of things as, as I was going into this, thinking about this, and, and all of us, you know, know the quote from Jesus, just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it will be uh, in the days of the Son of Man. And I mean, there's a lot of layers of that because you have the corruption of humanity spiritually, mentally, and then you have like the transhumanist movement and the advancement of technology and one of the things that's kind of hidden from the public that Steve Quayle and many others have brought out is that there's still, there is an Indiana Jones kind of archaeological race going on among the main powers to try to rediscover antediluvian technology that's actually more advanced than what we have today. And I, I think part of it is bringing back uh, the Watcher technology. But when we see the effects uh, that they had in Genesis 6-5, it says, And the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We need to understand that Babylon and the world absolutely corrupts. Now, Jesus, and, and the, the, this kind of, I want to kind of give hope in the midst of this, because remember when Jesus took his disciples to Mount Hermon? And, and he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And that rock was not Peter. That rock was the revelation knowledge mm -hmm. that, that he was the son of God, which actually refers to his kingship because the king of, of, of Israel was always adopted by God. The son of man actually refers to his divinity going back to the prophecy of Daniel, the one like the son of man that was standing before God and had a throne and he was considered equal with God. He took them there to Mount Hermon. Now, at Mount Hermon, you had the gates of hell. That was the, 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 the historically, the Greeks and the Romans all believed that that was the entrance to Hades there. They had a grotto of Pan. You had Nimrod's fortress on, on the top of it. Uh, you also, on the side, when you look at the topography, there's actually a goat's head in the topography of that mountain range. And many believe that is the place where Azazel has been, has been in, incarcerated ever since uh, Genesis 6. He took them there and he, he, he made a statement. He said, in the last days, because he, he, he spoke through the ones that were there to us now because they, they didn't they have to face the technology we have today. They didn't have to face watchers. 
Uh, I document in the Shiner Directive that there's, a, there's enough evidence both in the Word of God and in history that the watchers begin to be systematically released about the turn of the 20th century, although I think there have been some loose uh, that were, I think the main leaders were incarcerated by God as a part of the judgment. And he said, listen, when the full council of God, uh, and see the full council is Lucifer, the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, the Nephilim, and the watchers that have been incarcerated. So when he spoke that to Peter and all of them, they weren't going to face that. We're facing it today. And the promise of Jesus, Mary, is the gates of hell would not prevail against my called out ones who have been called out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And boy, I stand, he said, boy, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And that, and that particular binding and loosing scripture is all about spiritual warfare. Well, you know, the um, with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they both were put in impossible situations. They were. With Daniel with the lions with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace. And God took him through it all. And so if we put our face toward God and and refuse to bow to Babylon, I'm believing that a, a great anointing like was there in those, those miracles, we'll, we're going to see them. And I, I think what, one, of the, one of the anointings that, are, that is going to come on the remnant, I think is the same anointing that was on Daniel. Over and over again, it says he had an excellent spirit, mm -hmm. that his spirit was not contaminated. Now, I mean, he ended up holding the position of president of Babylon directly under the mm -hmm. king. He was almost like a Joseph Talk to about Pharaoh. God giving you favor. <laughs> giving you favor, uh, but it never corrupted him. He, mm -hmm. he never gave Babylon an inch when it came to the commandments of God. We, we need to understand, and, and uh, this is something the church has has lost an understanding of is that Babylon corrupts everything. In uh, in First John chapter two verses five fifteen through seventeen, uh, the apostle John warns us. He says, "Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father." but is from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. We need to understand that the modern church has a love affair with the world, and the love of the world has displaced the love of the Father in the hearts of many. The results of this is that there is widespread carnality in the church and its leadership. The church has learned from Hollywood and projects an image of really walking with God, but when you begin finding out what's going on in the background, it's all an illusion. And I'm beginning to get reports from all over America, and some of these are, are, are I think, some of the major ministries, that what's happening behind the scenes that they have covered up uh, sexual sins and all these different things, what we have seen in Kansas City is just the beginning. And for the sake of the remnant, God is getting ready to tear off the veil so that it all can be released, so that all will be revealed and will enable us uh, to see what's really going on in the church. And I think it's going to be, I think we're going to see more remnant members formed out of things that God's getting ready to do than ever before because the illusion is going to break. The other result of this love affair with the world that has perverted the gospel, the word of God, and the requirements of God to live holy. And just before Almighty God, you know, I was I was reading, uh, starting back reading through the Book of Romans, and when you when you understand um, how that the Apostle Paul approached his his epistle to Romans, he approached it as a rabbinical theologian, and so he's building up things, and and so sometimes when you take a snippet out of Romans and you don't understand everything he's already built, sometimes you can misunderstand the book of Romans, but he introduces the Holy Spirit, not as the Holy Spirit, but as the spirit of holiness. Mm -hmm. He said it was the spirit of holiness that raised Christ from the dead. And whenever the Holy Spirit is working in your life, he will produce holiness. When the spirit of the world is working in your life, 
he produces carnality, okay? And he begins building on that, and he shows, listen, the spirit of holiness raised Christ from, Christ from the dead, but all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need what Jesus did. And, and I, I think we're going to see, uh, and as, as God is as judging and revealing things, every sin that's hidden is going to be revealed, I think, in the next year or two, that is going to produce the fear of God. I, re, I remember reading through the book of Acts, and, and one of the interesting things that jumped out to me is uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It's the, it's the result of what happened in the assembly. The fear of God took hold of the people. Mm-hmm. And I, I think when, when, whenever we see God tearing off, and I, I think we may see where ministries, uh, that there has been sexual sin and all these things going on that God's getting ready to reveal, what Satan wants you to do is to doubt your salvation because brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so could have sinned. No, our, our salvation is not based in them. Who's it based in? It's based in Jesus, his completed work. But what it should do is cause us to fear God because God's doing some things. Now, and because the church has, has lost this and we have this love affair, what we also didn't calculate in so much of the church, Mary, doesn't understand Genesis 6. They don't teach the book of Revelation anymore. They don't teach the book of Daniel anymore. Uh, and, and in fact, I remember one day we were watching, uh, and it was uh, Judson Franklin and some other ministers talking, and, and this one guy said, listen, I've got a younger minister underneath me. He's pastoring a church of several thousand. And the light finally came on for this guy. He says, I need you to come and teach the book of Revelation for us. Because the way that this entire congregation, these young people are into technology, they'll line up for the mark of the beast if they don't know what's going on. And so the church has done a disservice by not teaching Bible prophecy the last 30, 40 years. But because of that, we weren't prepared. It's like with the beginning of the watchers. Can you imagine uh, like my grandma when she was alive? She saw a man going from horse and buggy getting electricity to putting a man on the moon. The cell phones that we carry now are 10,000 times more powerful in computing power than the equipment they had in the shuttlecraft when we, were, when we had the shuttles going in and out of space. That's almost mind-boggling mm, to me. It is. And, and every year it increases, it increases, it increases. And the, see, that's part of the thing. When, when you look at watcher technology, and I, I think that's what we're uh, dealing with, they, 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 they bring a perverted science, and we're seeing science being perverted on, on every quarter. Uh, it's, it's, uh, technocracy uses pseudoscience. You know, like wearing a mask will help protect you against the virus. No, it doesn't. It's, it's, it was a whole psychological, it was a psyop. We have that going on. We have advancements of technology that make men feel like they're becoming superior. In fact, many of them in the singularity movement have come up right out, Mary. They have said, we don't believe in God, but we're getting ready to make one that will give us all the answers. Can you see how that darkens the minds of men? As well as the, the watchers gave forbidden knowledge because it, it, it corrupts it. It's a perverted knowledge. They've, they've taken how the universe works, and they have perverted it with this corruption, and they're spoon-feeding that to man. Well, and they're using addiction. Yeah. Because most people are addicted to their phones. When, uh, when you look at, like, the development of Facebook and the original Twitter, you know, like the likes and the dings and all that stuff, uh, there, there is evidence that uh, Zuckerberg was given CIA seed money to start Facebook. Well, there's serotonin released, and it so is. It's, you it's know, brain chemical addiction. <laughs> and and I, I get, you know, it's just like, I've got one million friends. No, you don't. You know, the friends are ones you have, you have meeting face-to-face and stuff. This, this virtual reality stuff is just crazy. Well, and it lines us up to be um, have relationships through technology rather than face-to-face, which is another way of getting ready for the the antichrist you know years ago i'm sure there was there were people that were uh having all of these opinions on what the antichrist was going to be and how they do things it's not hard to see now is it no it's not when you look at if all your relationships are based through technology 
they're hollow. Uh, they leave you empty. And, and so then people long, there's, I mean, you, you long for human contact. And so what they're going to do is the next stage toward the mark of the beast is the hive mind. That you don't even need to go to school anymore. We'll just, we'll just simply plug you in all knowledge, and we have AI that will curate. They'll, it will it will uh, it will it will um, anticipate your every desire and every need because it's a it's, it'll be a fake Holy Spirit, and it will give you the information you need, and, and everybody will be one. And what is, what what it's not what they're not telling you is in in that process you lose your will. You no longer make choices for yourself. It's mm-hmm. being curated. That's why those that receive the mark of the beast uh, can't be saved. I, th- I, th- I think it's on several levels. Number one, they've lost their will. Because when Babylon goes down, it sold the souls of men. Not their physical bodies, their souls. Because it controlled what they thought, how they felt. It, it, cause can you imagine if you, if you know, and at least with TV today, and, you know, I, I get mad at the news, and Mary can tell you, like, sometimes I end up yelling at the TV screen because it's, it's, it's propaganda, you know. You can turn that off. When it's plugged into your head, you can't. And it will absolutely shape your reality and your mm-hmm. perception. It will take what they're doing in colleges and universities, what Hollywood has done, and this, it's going to put it on steroids beyond comprehension. And so you, you lose your soul that way. The other thing is they will so alter the DNA that you're no longer human. That makes you unredeemable. You're more Nephilim than you are human. All this stuff is coming. And what they're doing now in disenfranchising us from face-to-face relationships sets us up for the mark of the beast. Mm-hmm. This is one of the reasons that God has to judge some things and, and, to, and to break this techno-sorcery spell off long enough so that God can pull out the remnant. It's a really good idea to fast your phone and your, uh, all the technology for a while just to give yeah. your brain a break. <laughs> and, and sometimes, I mean, people, when they do that, they literally go through withdrawal as if they were on, I mean, the ones that are really addicted mm-hmm. to Facebook and Maybe all Maybe harder stuff. than giving up food for them. Yeah, or cocaine or anything else. <laughs> um, but guys... Judgment must come. Uh, it must come in 2024. In uh, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19, I want to read this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when they come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as mu- in, insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you were insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. So he's dealing with two things here. He's dealing with first, if you're living righteously and Babylon maligns you about it, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's a badge honor. (laughs) That's a badge honor. But then he goes on, he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a meddler. I found that interesting, meddler. Meddling in other people's affairs. Yet if someone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinners? I always... Probably, you know, I was raised in a church, you know, once saved, always saved. God can't get rid of you once you get in and you get your membership card. But the Bible says the righteous will be scarcely saved. It'll be all, all by it. We, we're, we're never going to be able to stand before Jesus and say, hey, man, it was you and me. No, <laughs> it was him. Mm-hmm. It was all him. Therefore, let those who suffer according to will of God entrust their souls to the faithful creator while doing good. And so he says, listen, when judgment must first start in the house of God, now if you're, if you're being persecuted for doing the right thing, that's something called pruning, which is a part of developing character in Christ. But he says, guys, don't, don't do evil. Don't, don't, let the, don't let the enemy get the upper hand because then God really has to judge you. Mm-hmm. And, and the difference is pruning and, and really judging. Uh, 
A couple of things I'm going to read here. The first one is from the New International Commentary. It says, yet, if, yet even if suffering has a good purpose and further uh, explanation of why it is happening is necessary, the reason, according to your author, is quite simple. It is time to begin the judgment. Now, God's judgment has already been cited several times in First Peter uh, the judgment not only indicates the final judgment, so there's, there's a linking to this into the final judgment, a judgment that the Old Testament indicated would begin with God's people and in his own temple, pass through the city and smite and begin at my sanctuary, Ezekiel chapter 9. The theme was developed as a concept of purifying judgment in intertestamental Judaism. It goes on to say that the early church picked up this theme and pointed out situations that God was judging and purifying his church. Thus, our author sees the final judgment is beginning now in the church, the house, and the temple, a judgment that is purifying. And I, I think that's God's purpose right now, Mary, and what he's getting ready to do is he, he has to, if, if he doesn't reveal the cancer, if he doesn't reveal the infection, it will take over everything. That's true. It'll spread. And you know, um, the reason I believe God is revealing so much right now is because so much of this was hidden. It, it was like child trafficking. Years ago, it was unheard of. Now, we, almost 30 years ago, we saw it. We, we didn't have any proof of it, but we saw evidence of it. Um, or in our mind, it was, it was clear that was what was going on. But, you know, all the things that God showed us through all this time, um, it makes you make changes. Once you see something, you'll make changes. If you see how the enemy's working, if you see how the evil is uh, just destroying people, you'll make changes. And Absolutely. right now, people have this ability to make a change. Yeah. You know, I remember when um, uh, the movie came out uh, with a guy who played Christ and the temptation of Christ, and they were on, on child trafficking. And there were a lot of believers that were absolutely grieved over the fact that this was going on to the place that it was going on. Then there were those that really didn't care. But Mary, I, I think one of the things, and, and I was uh, talking with a friend that they're also making a documentary on it, and he was getting absolutely pummeled by other believers because they were making this documentary, and they were coming against that movie because the the, the former Secret Service agent that saw this going on, that, I mean, he, sold, he sold his home, he sold everything to try to finance this, was, was a Mormon. And they were saying, well, then we can't believe this because this is a Mormon. And I remember his response was, when was the last time you got off your rear end and did something this, for, for children like this? That we have, we have, the world has hardened us in many areas, Mary. We should be grieved over what's going on. We, when we quoted Ezekiel, there were angels sent through the city to mark those who were grieving what was going mm -hmm. on. You see, I, I think that as, as God begins to judge and God begins to reveal, the true remnant are going to be grieved to their core at the extent of what's going on. Because it has perverted. I mean, I, uh, it, it, it breaks my heart. I, I have, you know, I have people say, you know, hey, have you listened to this preacher? This pre There's a lot of them I quit listening to because I have seen over the last 20 years them getting further and further and further away from truth. Uh, I, I and uh, I prefer a lot of times to go and, and read people that uh, theologians from the 19th century or earlier. Mary, they were on fire for God, mm -hmm. and and they they would call sin sin. They would call and this this is righteous acts, and this is the way you're supposed to live, and they they actually raised the bar. We have so lowered the bar that a cockroach couldn't even crawl under it anymore, and God's getting ready to take that bar because the bar, according to the Book of Ephesians, is the standard that Jesus set. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. Finest Dake, in, in his uh, annotated reference Bible, he makes this comment. He said, if the, if the righteous are found sinning, he judges them first. But I like what he adds. He says, and if they are found righteous, he delivers them from judgment. You see, the safety that we're going to have is in Christ. That's right. The safety that we're going to have is get right now. Mm -hmm. and, and to choose the, 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 the one thing in, in about Messiah that we find in Isaiah 11 was that he was quick in the fear of the Lord. 
He feared God more than anything else. That's, that's why he didn't care what men said. He didn't care what the religious leader said. He came to do the will of the Father. And he set our example. We only have to do the will of the Father, not the will of those around us. And, you know, and, and I've shared with this with, with you many times that uh, we've talked about certain ministers that because they listen to the people, they end up destroying their ministries. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we've got to listen to God. It's, it's got to be faithfulness to the word. God, the remnant are going to be like God's Marine Corps. Semper Fidelis, always faithful, no matter what. Daniel was always faithful. He was. The great men of God and the word of God were always faithful. When the Apostle Paul said the just shall live by faith, it's not what the faith movement has made it because they've, they've not gone back and read Habakkuk. Because Paul was quoting Habakkuk, mm-hmm. that the just shall live by his fidelity to the covenant. That in other words, there's something that happens when you get serious with God and you say, I will not follow the world. I will not follow the, the, the crazy cultural junk the world is constantly doing and it is constantly evolving. And it, Mary, it has gotten to the place where the, the inmates in the insane asylum have taken over. It's 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 gotten that bad. Well, they I, they supposedly let a bunch of them over our border. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about our leadership. Okay, well, that's but, been that way for a long whether, time. Whether whether it's teachers in school they've, or, or, or they've politics. tried to push complacency because if they can push you to complacency, they can get anything done. If you're yeah. just lackadaisical about what's going on, what you hear on the news, and you don't rise up and at least pray about it, you know there's some things you um, you can't do anything about but pray. But I just, I well, just we, think I think we can pray and make our voice heard. Oh, for sure. Because there, there's a principle of the Illuminati. Now, the, the Illuminati do believe in karma, okay? And so they, they, they have a very perverted code of ethics. Their code of ethics is now we'll, we'll, we'll begin doing these things, and we have to present it to you first. If there's backlash, we can't do it. Well, they always have a, a double thing going on. They have okay. We're gonna we're gonna try to get everybody to accept this sin, and if you don't accept it, you're the bad guy. And yeah. then they press this whole agenda well, then I'm the and narrative guy. that that well, you don't have any love. Didn't Jesus walk in love? Yes, yes, he did. But he also he also did what needs to be done today. He went out and cleared the Illuminati, the the money ch- <laughs> excuse me, the money changers <laughs> out of the temple twice, mm-hmm. and he didn't do it very nicely either. And, you know, I, I remember reading one commentator years ago, and it was talking about the strength of Christ. He was a carpenter, which meant he also dealt with, with marble as much as he did wood. He said, when was the last time you saw a banker have an old rickety little wooden table? He said, these were permanent fixtures in the temple, and they were made, and they were made most likely out of marble. What, and they had temple guards that were there, to. And when he came in there and he threw over the money changers' tables, they were most likely marble tables. He displayed, he displayed such a godly manifestation of the power of God in turning over the tables and the cats and nine tails that the temple guards backed off. Well, and we need to be um, just as passionate about the things of God right now. Yes. And we we just let it all slip. We just I, you can look back over the last fifty, sixty years and just see a constant decline. Yeah, and we we got to get out of this Hollywood mentality of the church. I mean, you you can you can take a goat and you can put him in an Armani suit, and he will say all the right things, but it doesn't change his nature that he's a goat. And we, we have gotten to this thing where if it looks right and it's real big and it's a real slick production, I can't imagine John the Baptist doing that. You know, John the Baptist came out of, came out of the desert looking like a wild man and preaching repentance. <laughs> and uh, people listen because they, they could, we, we, we need to, if we can't hear the voice of God in the voice of the individual, and when you strip off the Hollywood, you better still be finding Jesus. Then we need to quit supporting it. We, we need to quit supporting it. And, uh, and I have feared for a long time. I, have, I think there are still some good Christian networks out there, but I think 
that uh, the elite have taken over a lot of the Christian networks and some of the king builders within that system are, are promoting people with all the wrong messages. And I, I remember years ago, and this was back in the 90s, when Rod Parsley kind of called them out on that and he, and he said, he said, you need to start checking these people's doctrine and instead of whether their check will clear or not. And the response of many of the networks is they took him from an hour to 30 minutes. It wasn't his choice. They said, you're cut off. Because they became gatekeepers. And there was, and what should have happened when you had somebody, when this, this is when Lester Summerall was still alive and everything else, this should have caused the networks to back up and say, wait a minute, maybe we need to look at, relook at our model. It didn't. We're going to cut off a guy who just called us out because of what we're doing. And so I, I think a lot of these, the enemy has put forward because they're wearing five thousand dollar suits and they have a, a I know a million dollar smile and all these things and they're they're saying all the right things to placate the flesh, but they're also perverting the gospel. The gospel crucifies the flesh. It says, "Listen, this is sin. This will always be sin. The cross did not change what sin is." Grace is the power of God to overcome sin, and this is what righteousness is, Mm -hmm. and this is what following Christ looks like. And and I've always, and and, you know, I'm I'm very charismatic. I came out of the charismatic movement. I started Baptist and got spirit filled when I was seventeen, and I've seen the charismatic movement when it was true. Mary, there was there was a holy fear of God, and when you look at the beginning of Azusa Street. There was a reverence before God, and people would come because of the miracles and the different things, but if, if they came two or three times and they didn't get right with God, the Holy Spirit would begin releasing prophetic words and call their sins out. I mean, uh, one, one, of the, one of the things, well, and you, you want to talk about a stage. This guy didn't have a stage. That, that old black preacher that started Azusa Street, he had an orange crate that he had set up and built him a pulpit, Mary. And most of the time, he was laying on his face with his head in that orange crate, seeking the face of God. And that caused the power of God to flow. And one of the characteristics of the Azusa Street Revival is everyone walked on eggshells before God. You'll, you'll see that repeated over and over and over again. Because if, if we want that same spirit that rose Christ from the dead to dwell in us, he's the spirit of holiness. That's it. He's the spirit it's of key. holiness. It's absolutely key. Oh, I can't emphasize this enough, guys. He's the spirit of holiness. He's not the spirit of Babylon. That's why Satan's trying so hard to get everybody to believe it's okay to sin. Yes. It's okay. You know, even in the churches, they'll say, oh, Jesus paid the price. It's all done. So... You don't have to worry about that. Oh, my goodness. Well, they're, they're preaching grace as now we have the license to sin. Well, see, every, every time someone sins, unless it's repented of, it just builds this big power. That's, that's what you can see. And if you, if you, watch, if you watch these things that, that happen, um, like after February is bigger than what people think because they just think, oh, Valentine's Day is nothing. I've heard ministers say, yeah, it came from Lupercalia and things like that, but, but there's nothing to it. It's yeah. just a good time to show, show love. I am sick and tired of hearing, but that doesn't matter. It if does it, matter. It because does you, matter. You can sit every time, and on, on the holidays, it's like I've watched all these years. There, there's catastrophes. Yes. There's catastrophe. The enemy builds power, and I think there's especially power built when Christians do these things. Oh, absolutely! Just like, let's say, let's say a believer that isn't fully healed and restored and sanctified, if the devil can get their mouths going against what God is doing, hell revels in it. Mm-hmm. And and I, I remember years ago, and then this was. My goodness, it was back when uh, Derek Prince and Bob Mumford and all of them were were in Germany uh, for a conference that I was at, and he started calling things out. He he said, "Listen, 
He said, the last thing you want is see somebody get saved, and there's a bunch of old cranky ladies in the back of the church saying, this ain't going to last more than a week. He said, Why, where's the sisters praying and saying, this is going to be permanent. We're yeah. going to see them go on in God. Yeah, that's right. And Our mouths are significant. Our mouths <laughs> are really significant. Are. The Bible says, you know, God put a, put a guard over my mouth. Now, this, this is some things that God has, has told me. He said, listen, the landscape of the church is going to change dramatically in 2024-25. Mm-hmm. The sins that have affected the modern church must be revealed and judged by heaven for the sake of the remnant. God will both will move to both remove and to prune his vineyard. Now, for that, I'm, I'm going to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So this is a time. It doesn't, it, well, I think one of the things that God is saying is, if you say you're a Christian, if you say you're in ministry, you have put yourself in my vineyard whether you're there or not. Okay, and so the father is going to come with a set of pruning shears and an axe. And I and I and I've thought about this, and I, I shared this in in the the Kingdom Priesthood book that that prophecy that uh, that brother in Canada had about the last great revival. And he saw it within the the prism of healing ministry because that was was what he was all about. But he he saw the the body of Christ that it was almost like. Um, Gulliver all tied down and stuff. and Gulliver's and Travels. Gull- Gulliver's yeah. Travels. And every time that the, the church would try to raise up, these demons would lull it back to sleep. Oh, just be, just be content in Babylon. Just, it's okay. You've got grace. You've got whatever. And he said, then he saw the Spirit of God moving, and the church stood up, and it did. All the demons fled. But one of the things that stuck out to me in, in this, he said, all the men of God that I thought would be prominent in this move of God, that were prominent in the church, that had the ministries in place, he said, they just drifted off to the background, never to be seen again. And he said, like all these John the Baptists began to be released out of the desert Mm -hmm. that had been faithful, that had been set aside for such a time as this. And I've wondered with this if that wasn't revealing both God's acts and God's pruning. Uh, God... God wants the character of Christ established in you more than anything else. And and I remember years ago I was in Canada, actually in a in a in a uh, medium security federal prison up there. I went up there and I preached, and uh, I got a lot of backlash from the prisoners because I said, "Listen, God cares more about developing the character of Christ in you than getting you stuff." And they had already went through a bunch of prosperity teaching mm. up there. <laughs> and that offended them. Yeah, It offended them. But the Bible does, does say that we have been predestined to be conformed into having a bunch of stuff. Yeah. We have been predestined to be conformed into the image, image of That's his right. dear son. Jesus is the standard. And anybody that either tries to change who Jesus is in the Word, tries to change what the Word of God has revealed about him, they're guilty of building of, of an idol. It's another Christ. Well, there's a lot of that going on. And so in the church today, we have a lot of idol worship because we have made an image of Jesus that placates our flesh. Yeah, it's what people want him to be. But when you look at Jesus, and, and, you, and you, the Bible says that the goodness of God brings us to repentance. When, when I see the price he paid, and I saw, see the life he lived, and the standard that he set, it convicts me, and that yeah. goodness causes me to repent, and I choose to be more like him. And the Apostle Peter says, listen, when you're being persecuted, when people are maligning you because you're being like Jesus, that's a good thing. It is good. In fact, the very name Christian was given to the, to the believers in Antioch because it was the pagans maligning them. They're saying, you're just going around trying to be like a bunch of little Christs. You're just trying to be like Jesus, and you're just, you're just... And they said, thank you, I'll take that as a badge of honor. And Mary, we have so diluted that. 
Yeah, it's it's scary. I mean, I back you know when I first came out of my depression, I I looked at um, you know all the people I was listening to and just just seeking anything I could find because I I was so hungry for the word and hungry for to see God move and things. But man, alive through the years, as my my uh, as I've sought to to get more re- refinement, you know, because that's I mean, I, when you are in such a mess as I was. You seek that refiner's fire because you want it off of you. Yeah. You don't want any ties to the kingdom of darkness. You want to be free so we can we can function in God's kingdom. And I think we're going to enter into it. This year is going to be a Malachi moment where it says that the Messiah will show up in the temple and we're the temples with a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. He'll show up suddenly. I, I think this is what Jesus was talking about in in. In uh, John 15, although I, I think it's always been a process God has done, but how much so more now than ever before? He is coming back for a church, for those called out of Babylon, who's who are washed clean by the blood yeah. lamb. There, there's no wrinkle, there's no stains in their garments. Verse 3 says, Already you, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. And as a branch cannot bite in itself... Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Why can he say that? Because you've come to the place that his will has become your will. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the verse we, we, st- we stood on when we found each other and got married, that delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And we read that all along. When, when I delight in the Lord, he begins depositing new desires in me. That's right. And back when we both were standing on that. We were a mess. <laughs> well, and as our lives proceeded as a married couple, it looked like, this this can't be right. You know that's what I kept saying is is I I married the wrong man. This can't be right. But but look at what God did. He gave us the desires of our heart for right now. He did, and I'm so glad, Mary. Oh, I'm so thankful because there were you know there's we just went through so many rough years. But look at what God's done. And I mean, there you talk about going through a refiner's fire. Oh, Me yeah. more than you. I mean, I was such a mess and. Um, I'm so thankful, so thankful that God pulled me out of that pit so I could and I could go ahead and, and go through what you're talking through right now because what's going on for most people right now, I've walked through. Yeah. And and here's the good news. It's so good on the other end. Yeah. It's good on the other end. If there was a if there was a term called super stupid smart, you would find a picture of me in the Webster's dictionary the way I was back then. <laughs> So let, let's go, and he says, But by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. In the days ahead, what's coming? The pruning and the chopping are going to reveal those who are disciples of Christ, which means that you discipline yourselves according to the teachings of Messiah. Okay? As my Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And that's the whole purpose, Mary, of the Hebraic Roots movement. And, I mean, there are things that God's got ready to judge in it because, I mean, there were even some groups in the area here that I I have heard about that are almost getting cultish. And I think there's this, and I think we're seeing that in the Pentecostal Baptist and in many other areas. But the reason of the Hebraic Roots movement was so that we would fall more in love with the Jewish Messiah and that we would prove that love by keeping his commandments. Okay, We're fulfilling scripture. And he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I spoke to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. With what God's getting ready to do, there's going to be a shaking. 
And I think it's the prelude. I don't think we're to the shaking. The book of Hebrews talks about where the, even the heavens are shaken, shaken because I think that happens during the tribulation period that I think every principality, power, and ruler of darkness are going to be shaken out of the second heaven into the first. But this, this, is, this is the tremors before that happens for the sake of the body so that we can bear much fruit. Mary, there's so much going on in the church today that does not honor God. That is not bearing biblical fruit. No, and when when things get rough, and I'm not I'm talking about things showing up. You know, there's there's a a really good um, chance that there's going to be some earthquakes. It's going to open up some things underground, and people are going to see things. And, and it's not going to shake me, but it's going to shake most people. Yeah, um, because. I've already seen some of that stuff. Yeah. But but you know what though? That's why God's allowing this now. Yes. If if you'll go through this refiner's fire, if if you'll just not just sit down and say this is too hard. I just can't go through this God, this is too too hard. If you'll if you'll say I'm going to go through it. Just like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, just say I'm going through it and God's going to deliver me through it. If you'll get that attitude, you'll be the remnant. Yeah. You'll be the ones that can stand there. And if, if you know, something big's headed, headed towards you, you just say, hey, you have to bow your knee to Jesus. You know, and, and, and putting this together today, too, I was thinking about Job and how Job impressed me. When you, when you set Job back in the historical context, he predates Abraham. He had just one promise from God. God says, I'm going to protect your life. All the other stuff was gravy, okay? None of that was promised to him by God. And he didn't understand the spiritual dynamic of what was happening and, and, that, and what Satan was doing or anything else. Here he is in the midst of he has lost everything. He's sitting there with boils from head to foot. And his wife says, won't you just curse God and die? His response was, though he slay me, I will praise him. Yeah. And we have, to, we have to look at those examples that God made sure we had in his word. Yeah. So at this time, when we are so far away from what we're supposed to be, that we can look at them and say, God, God took them through. He'll take us through. And just let that faith just rise up within you. That he's going to take us through. No matter what goes on, he's going to take us through. You know, this back after the Shiner Directive first came out, I got a call from a guy. It's been so long, I don't remember his name, I remember the circumstances. And he had taught on spiritual warfare for years. But he had never come across a demon. You know, it's easy, and, and this is the way he said it. He said, it was like I was a kid playing on the playground, and the bully never showed up. And so me and a bunch of other little kids walk around saying how powerful we were and how this, and he said, one day the devil showed up. And he said, I remember sitting there saying, oh, my God, this is real. And he said, I've not developed any confidence in my authority in Christ. He said, he said, I was like that little kid spouting about how mean and how bad and how tough I was, and there were no bullies on the playground. And what came up in my spirit was, okay, you're now being tested. You've preached it for years. It's now time mm -hmm. to live it. Yeah, that's it. And, and you need to go back and go back over those scriptures, get them deep in your heart, and start using them because even though you were preaching it, you weren't using that spiritual muscle. And the body of Christ is going to break. We're going to have to grow a thick skin because the world will try to cancel you. They'll try to shame you. They'll say all manners of evil against you falsely for his sake. I see I'm quoting scripture right now. Jesus foretold all of this. Yeah, but there's there's a new anointing coming. Yes. For this period, and where when that starts, you're already going to be on top of it. Yeah. You're going to speak with such authority that heaven's going to back it up, and they will flee from you. They, it, there's authority coming to those that are willing to walk through this refiner's fire. That it is going to shake things. It's not going to be any longer where they're just mocking you and mocking you. You know, like like the way that they did Jesus on the cross. Yeah. 
But then there was a day he arose, wasn't there? There was, and I, I even think when all this stuff first started happening, when the occult were coming after us, they were mocking us, they were mm -hmm. arrogant, and it came to the place that when they would see us in Walmart, they start running the other way. I don't know if that's because they saw angels or what. I never have known, but but God was there one way or the other. Christ in us, the hope of glory. <laughs> but guys, there is an authority coming that you're destined to walk in. Mm-hmm. The only thing between you and it are the things that God is going to get ready to prune off. Now, I'm not saying that horrible things are going to come and happen to you, but God's going to let situations happen so he can reveal to you places where the, the character of Christ has not been established mm -hmm. so that you can repent and begin working on yeah, it. Yeah, and get all those areas lined up. Get all those areas. But each time you do that, I think your, your authority level and your power level is going to go up. They will. And the good news is, is when you go through these refiner's fires, you get closer and closer to that place where it's, it's almost um, boring for there not to be something heavy going on. Yeah. I, I, I'm just made this way. I function the best. Under fire. <laughs> under fire. Yeah. And guys, what, what God is trying to do is things are going to get heavy in the days ahead. He needs you with your A game. That's right. The body of Christ needs you sanctified, fired up, powered up with the word of God in your heart, the word of God in your mouth. And it, it's like you are loaded for bear with a hair trigger. Because when the devil shows up, God is saying, you know, you may have been thank you may have been using a, a BB gun to go after demons mm -hmm. in the past. I'm getting ready to give you a bazooka. That there's, there's, there's not going to be anything left but their shoes by the time you get done with them. And you'll be safely in that place. Because yes. that, a lot of what me and Mike have walked through was one step after another, getting our character lined out, getting everything uh, in the past taken care of, seeking how God handles this situation and that and learning from it. And then you just, you just there's a consistent growth. Yeah. And I think right now everybody's going to be in an accelerated place to where – you know, where we just had to walk through this a step at a time, I think we're to that place where yeah. the years that the locusts have eaten, years that the canker worm have eaten, are going to be restored. They're going to be restored, and I think it's going to be at an accelerated rate. So where, that's good news. Where <laughs> you are right now in Christ, and you being born in this time did not surprise God. He didn't, mm -mm. He didn't grab an angel's uh, sleeve and say, oh my goodness, look, Mike and Mary is in this time. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. None of that happened. He, he knew. It was planned. It was, it, was, it was planned from the foundation of the world. And as we seek his face and become remnant ready, there is going to be an accelerator. What, what's going to happen is you're going to have a hunger for the word of God like you've never experienced before. I don't, I don't care if you're 18 or 80, it doesn't matter. That hunger is going to be there, and you're going to have accelerated growth, accelerated consecration, mm -hmm. and then accelerated power. I believe that. And you're going to start seeing souls saved. You're going to start seeing, and why, why, why does God have to do all this? Why does God have to purify us? So that when he begins moving in power through you, you won't take the glory. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You know where it belongs, and it's got to go to him. And you're, you're not going to go on this pseudo thing of what, what's called fake humility. Is you know you you can have people say things, and it's so wonderful that God used you and everything else. And the key is we see in the life of Jesus that every night he went and, and he would go before the Father, and he would say. I didn't do anything unless you told me to do it. I didn't say anything unless you told me to say it. And it was you doing it through me. It was you doing it through me. All the glory and the honor belongs to you. Thank you for allowing me to be your FedEx man. Well, we're getting ready to see enough things that I think that's going to be easier than it may have been in the past, like 50, 60 years, because people are going to see there is no way this can be done without God. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so Jesus shares these things about both the chopping and the pruning. And he said, it's for my joy and for your joy. 
because what is now released through you, all this fruit. And you say, Mike, you know, I'm, I'm maybe 60 years old and I've not had a lot of fruit. Yield to this and you'll have a bumper crop mm-hmm. that'll make up for all the years. That's right. It'll make us, it's going to be a supernatural bounty of kingdom purpose. I do not think there's going to be a remnant member. The Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians talks about the judgment seat of Christ for the church. And everything that we do is going to be piled before him. And his judgment fire is going to fall on it. All things that we did in the flesh, we're in league with Babylon, it's all going to be burned up. And, and Paul says, listen, there's some people that are going to be there that have nothing. And he says, you're going to simply get in by my grace. But why is it gold, silver, and precious gems? That's what crowns are made of, Mary. Mm-hmm. That all the fruit that he bears now, that we bear now, you never appear before the Lord empty-handed. The fruit that you bear now, you get to take with you. And you get to have it in your possession long enough to have the honor of casting it at his feet. Mm -hmm. And guys, for every one of you, what I pray is that when we get to that moment, that when you cast that crown at his feet, that it will give a a ring that will be heard through heaven. Mm -hmm. Because the loudness of the thump, the loudness of that ring brings glory to what he was able to do through you. And I want that for you guys. Help us to be yielded. Help us to be yielded, Father. Father, I just pray over the remnant. Father, let's even start the pruning process ourselves. Father, the word says that if we judge ourselves, we have no need that anybody judge us. Father, we ask that you would prune us. Forgive us of all our sins, Father. By the washing of the water of the word, and that the word of God would explode with meaning like never before. Father, let us be quick to read, quick to understand, quick to repent, quick to discard Babylon, and quick to embrace Christ. Our desire is that the only things that we draw, spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally even, Father, to simply be from Christ. We want everything to come from the vine. We want your mind. Not the weeds of Babylon. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.